Saint Anger was, quote unquote, like wearing a, a pair of old comfortable shoes again, according to you. A year later, do you still enjoy wearing those shoes? I'd say so, yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, I, I definitely enjoy wearing those shoes. Um, the shoes are um, definitely um, have weathered pretty well in the last year. I think that um, obviously um, St. Anger, you know, it feels great. You know, I can understand the, the main, main difference now between now and then is that I can understand um, the difference between, um, you know, how, how challenging people found the record in the beginning. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, people are like, this record's really challenging. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, it's just the next Metallica record. I can see now when I put it on, I go, whoa, this is a bit of a mouthful for, you know, the last song was I Disappear and No Leaf Clover, King Nothing or whatever. The last few songs we threw out in the late 90s were, I can see the challenge in that now, but I'm proud of that. And I'm proud because Metallica has always been about shifting gears and about, you know, throwing it for a loop and, and, and kind of having crazy fun with what we do and, 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 and you know, it, it just, to me, that's the Metallica spirit. It has been a little bit surprising to me and a little bit bewildering that people were so, I guess to me it's surprising that people were so surprised by this because to me, it's just, it's such a, just a natural extension of who we are, like we're talking about in the comfortable shoe analogy, do you know what I mean? Um, and, um, you know, I think that the record, you know, it, we finished it about a year ago right now. We're talking here in late March, and, and I think it's, it, it's, it's held up well. And I think, you know, it'd be really interesting to see if we do Metallica, you know, 2009 or something, if we're sitting on five years, and talk about, you know, I'd like to see how we look back on it then and how people look back on it. Because I remember, man, when the Justice album came out in, what was it, 1953 or something, it, it, it there was a pretty polarized reception to that. That was a lot of people that couldn't understand the way it sounded and that were put off by the kind of garage qualities in it and, and the lack of hi-fi and all this type of stuff. And now for a lot of Metallica people, and it's sort of like the cornerstone, you know. So I don't know, we'll see, man. A year in, it feels good. And um, it's just, you know, I'm proud of the fact that we made the record. I'm proud of the fact that you know, we lasted another year just to sit and look back on it, you know? Not only with the lack of radio play that St. Anger got nationally, but even the fact that the record company had to struggle for it, it had to feel a bit like Kill 'Em All. With that in mind, do you feel the band has somewhat come full circle? Um, man, I, I'm, I'm not the, the, the best one with talking about those kind of analogies, full circle, not, you know, Kill 'Em All this. Metallica's place in the you know, cultural universe, 2004 and all that. There are people that can do that much better than me. Um, I feel that we have um, once again proven to every, everybody that you should never take Metallica for granted. Metallica for granted. And to me, that, that was always, that, to me, that's the Metallica spirit. And, um, you know, full circle, I, I don't know. And I, I, I don't think it's a circle as much as a journey. You know, I've, I've said this a couple times in the last year. You might have heard me say it. You can start rolling your eyes right now. But to me, it's, it's a forward-moving journey that once in a while moves through neighborhoods that look familiar or feel familiar. You know what I mean? It's like, haven't I been here before? But to me, it's still moving forward. It's not necessarily circling. Um, I, I'd like to think it, it as a continuous journey forward. All the live shows for the Madly and Anger at the World Tour are now easily and quickly available to the public. So obviously Metallica's brought a mobile studio on the road with them. Now, are you guys utilizing that as well for new material? Well, we, so... um, yeah, we have a studio on the road, and you know, the definition of studios can obviously be varied, but we have recording equipments with us on the road. Mike Gillies, who has done um, the last four or five records with Bob Rock, he's kind of Bob Rock's sidekick. Um, he's with us, traveling full time. Um, we get together every night about 30 minutes before we go on stage and um, jam, riff through all these fun things, spur of the moment stuff. Now that we're playing a lot of different old songs and pulling a lot of older stuff out of our our back catalog, those get one or two airings as we are in the, in the 
in the studio there and then trying to sort of get in the moment. I, starting with songs like Blackened and Battery and, and some of the really, really super fast stuff that we do and have been doing for the whole year. It's not so easy on the old 40-year-old battered bodies, you know. So we, um, by the time we get up on stage, we're, we're about about 20 to 30 minutes into our night actually playing. So we're nice and warmed up and, and so on. So we get good jams in. Mike Gillies records them. We have some fun on the old stuff. We warm up, you know, whoever's around. It, it's like a good time. And it's something that we didn't used to do a lot in the early days. And, and so we're much more... Um, comfortable playing all the time and 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 just kind of being around music you know 10 years ago was more like oh time to go on let me put my little silly shorts on and get up on stage now you know we warm up we have a trainer with us who works with our you know arms and our necks and our backs and you know it, it, it's kind of um it's kind of uh it's a little more um you know, we're a little more mature about some of that and treat it a little more seriously and try and make sure that that nothing hopefully will happen, you know, in terms of, of injuries or any of that type of stuff. But uh, I think I'm straying from the original question. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, Mike was telling me about that in Seattle. I was like, man, I never thought about that. What are these, these bands are idiots. Why didn't they do this a long time ago, you know? Uh, like, who would not get warmed up before they go out there, you know? So you're not just going out cold, but you're also into it. Your adrenaline's already just fucking going, you know? Especially when you're just jumping into the shit you guys jump into. You can't ease into that. Let's talk about the book. So far, so... Wait. So, what is it again? I don't know. Uh, so far, so bad, so ugly. Uh, uh, whatever it is. I can't think of it. Anyway. Inserted, I, I don't know what it's... What's it's the, so far, so good, so mad. Or? So ugly. So far, so 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 what? So good, so so far, so mad. Oh wait, so far, so good. So all right, whatever. Um, oh, the the good, the mad, and the ugly. That's it. Yeah. The new book was the writer Stefan Shirazi. Uh, was he given a complete open door policy? I mean, how how much editing, if any, was done by the band members? I mean, you, did you guys read through the book and go, well, I don't know if I want that in there, or did you, did he just have an open door and just write whatever you want, just compile the So What magazine? And um. Well, I'd like to think that if, you know, anything that's been on So What magazine was suitable for printing or reprinting. I mean, what we prided ourselves about, you know, the So What magazine for all those years was that we felt that it was, um, it was a, it, such a personal, direct connection to the fans. Do you know what I mean? And, and it, it, it just felt like maybe there would be some people that would appreciate that outside of a fan club. And, and so there were some bits, the best bits, the bits that were the most, um, uh, I don't know, personal and interesting and maybe uh, kind of represented time capsules more than other, you know, you know? And, and Stefan, look, I mean, Stefan's been a close personal friend of ours for north of 20 years. And, and so obviously there's nothing but trust so he, he gets carte blanche to do I haven't actually seen a final copy of the, of the thing yet, but I will um, look forward to doing that. And, and I um, doubt seriously that other than a couple of, of, of layout things or a couple of um, kind of uh, typographical things or whatever, that uh, I'm sure there aren't going to be any issues. Yeah. Um, what was it like seeing yourself on the big screen for the first time? Regarding the movie, some kind of monster out in Georgia. Yeah, I mean, you get you know, you get used to seeing yourself on the screen. I mean, um, once you get past the double of the triple chins and, and all that type of stuff, the receding hairlines, um, it's it, the movie itself. I mean, it, it's it's obviously it's a bit of a roller coaster ride to watch because it's um, it's represents a difficult time period in my life and so when I look at that time period I um I get kind of brought back to it and 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 get reminded of how difficult some of that stuff was that we were going through at the same time I'm incredibly proud of of making the movie of the fact that we had the balls the guts to um to see the movie through do you know what I mean and to um stick with it and, 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 and to sort of bear our souls, bear ourselves, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely very, very proud of that. Um, 
And I've seen it so many times now that I, I just, you know, it, it becomes more about characters, you know, on screen. And, and, and it becomes more about like third person stuff, you know what I mean? These next couple questions refer to the movie. Over, this was in the movie too, over 90 million albums since 1981. What kind of party will you throw when you hit 100 million and will I be invited? Uh, we probably hit 100 million as we've been sitting here talking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. I, that's the kind of stuff that they use to sell that kind of shit. You know, I don't look at it like that so much. All right. Um, let's... The movie touches on your interest in art, which I never really knew anything about, but compare how an artist... Have you seen the movie? Yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> compare, how create, and compare how an artist creating a painting to Metallica creating a song. Well, I think it's about a purging of yourself, and it's about a, a, a kind of a, a process of, of, of finding a way to let what's inside you out without kind of, um, you know, without bending it too much, without altering it too much, without giving it a particular purpose you know and the artists that I've been into have always been the ones who I feel like who purge themselves in the purest way and just let stuff that came from inside out without it being um in any way contrived conceived having a kind of particular endpoint in, in mind or anything like that you know what I mean so um I would definitely say that um that there's a correlation you know we've tried as much as possible to be as pure about the material as possible, be as protective of the material as possible, and to make sure that the, the material was not polluted, um, was not polluted by, by anybody or anything, and, and that we, we, we sort of kept it as clean as possible. And then I guess in, 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 in that way, is it, 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 it becomes, um, those becomes the, the parallels, you know, those become the parallels. Very interesting when you're talking about you know, the, the art and that, that one of your paintings. You're like, How did he know that it was done? How did he know? Like, yeah, I know when to stop. And I do the same thing at home when I'm like producing a piece or uh, like, exactly. you know, doing research for an interview. Like, how many times do you need to write, rewrite the shit? You know, you gotta stop. Um, what was the Sabbath esque song that I was hearing in the movie when you were when you were playing tapes for your well, as Robert Trujillo refers to Gandalf the Grey, your father Torben, when he said, "Delete that." Do you know he calls your father that? <laughs> Gandalf the Grey. He goes, you mind you Gandalf the Grey from Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Like, no, it's Lars' dad. Remember that in the movie? Yeah. He, he, you were talking to him about, the, I guess, all the stuff you guys were coming up with from the Presidio tapes. And yeah, I can't remember which song. I mean, dude, there's tons of stuff from the Presidio. There's tons of stuff from um, that um, have just been laying around um, from those years that st that's still laying around. Um, I, I can't remember what okay. particular songs. There was a lot of ex experimenting done, a lot of, of stuff that uh, that that just was um, uh, kind of came up in the moment. Um, a lot of stuff that wasn't really turned into songs, but more remained ideas. And um, it's just I, I don't know. It, it just there's there's probably about another thirty bits laying around right. still. Yeah. I, I don't know if you want to even talk about this because I've always been afraid to even ask, but you know, since it came up in the movie, part of the therapeutic process included a meeting between you and Dave Mustaine. What, if any, is the relationship like between you and Dave now? Um, I don't have much of a relationship with Dave Mustaine. I, you know, he, um, we, we shared our moments together a couple of years ago, and, and since then we haven't spoken much. Um, he... I think kind of just went into his own head for a while, and I haven't heard from him since he came back out. Okay. That blew me away. That he, you uh, know, that he was that's that. pretty strong, isn't it? Yeah. Um, compare, like, if you were a kid, you were a fan of a band, and you went to the show, and you wanted your own personal recording. Like, remember how it was back then with the shitty cassette players? Like, compare that to what, like, Metallica's doing for their fans and the what? recording equipment now, what you guys are offering. I, you know, I, we, we just try, man. A couple of years ago, we, we, we put that whole taper section thing together for the kids where they could bring in recording equipment and, and kind of um, 
you know, take the show home with them. What we try and do now is is offer that same thing. You know, back in the day, I mean, when I went and saw Deep Purple in 1973 or whatever, if I could have taken the show home with me, I, I don't know what kind of mind fuck that would have been. But, you know, it's definitely, look, the Internet obviously provides new opportunities, a whole new horizon, a whole new set of, of, of tools to play with and have fun with. And um, the fact that we can give people the ultimate concert experience which is come to the concert experience the concert and then take the experience home with you and relive the experience over and over again through the internet to me is, is such an awesome thing such a natural thing and and such a, a great opportunity to just make the fans feel more connected to us you know regarding the live show can you describe or maybe compare the feeling of walking on stage those very few times, those first few times back in 1981, to, to compared to like how comfortable you feel now, what it's like before you walk out there now. Uh, it's definitely more of a sense of appreciation, more of, of having my eyes open, more of uh, being in the moment, and uh, not thinking so much about like let's get this gig over so we can go get drunk or go get laid or something. I, I'm definitely much more appreciative generally. I'm more open and in the moment all over the place and including on stage and obviously this stage this new st stage setup all the moments we're having I mean they're they're just they're amazing and and um being out there in the round so close to so many more fans so many more people four front rows the drummers out you know in front also just like with the rest of the guys it's it's so cool and I'm just so appreciative of the fact that we can still do that and you know, 15,000 people show up in Seattle like yesterday or 8,000 people show up in Casper, Wyoming or whatever, do you know what I mean? It's just so cool and when we walk out on stage, that transformation from being back here in these cavernous, cavernous dressing rooms and you know, all this kind of weird cold vibe back in you know, the back of these arenas to um, to, uh, to just going up on stage and feeling the warmth and the love from everybody is, is just so awesome. One thing I loved about the show in Seattle was, because I, I, it's the first time I've seen this, the show for this tour, I was like, after, what other band, after every single song, does the drummer get out from behind his kit and just like go up with a huge smile on his face and just start talking to people and slapping each other's hands? Like, what's I know, it's after so After cool. every song, you're like, there he is, he's out. He's out from behind his set again. Well, it's just so cool. I got a lot of kind of nervous energy when I'm on stage. I mean, it's very intense. You know, this is a very intense show when you're, I think a lot of the reason drummers kind of end up in the background and end up back there is because they, they, they kind of sit there and, and they kind of hide a little bit and they do their thing and then play their whole thing down. And there was a reason front men are front men, but so it's like, now that I'm out, out amongst it, it's sort of like, I got a lot of nervous energy, so I just kind of like run around and try and get in people's faces. And because anything beats like sitting down on that stool waiting for James Hetfield to finish his raps, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm just like, I get so amped generally when I'm playing and, and when I'm doing the whole thing that I just, I, I just run around and, 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 and try and harness energy and, and share energy and receive and give and, and all that stuff and it's just really fun to have the opportunity to do that instead of be stuck on a fucking 14 foot drum riser you know two area codes away from the rest of the band and the audience you know what i mean yeah. i took my older brother to his first metallica show in like 20 years in seattle and we were just laughing our ass off at the end because you obviously have the most physically strenuous job of the band and here it is at the end, they were about to do an encore, and it was like, and you start walking off stage, and you know, James talked to me, and he's like, one more song, and you were just like, oh, God, one more uh, song. I mean, you could tell you were just having a great time, like, all right, just one more, one more, that's it. Very funny. Um, Saint Anger was described by some as a return to the sound that originally put Metallica on the, on the map. Are you trying to mirror that feeling with this tour? Like, it just seems so raw with the light bulbs when you guys start. And I ain't trying to mirror anything, man. I we just don't live in the past that is not us i mean you look we have an incredible catalog of songs and it's great to be able to always go back there and pull them out but we don't live in the past man we, we look we live in the present and the future and this is not you know this is not you know rock and roll nostalgic trip this is not 
I don't want to mention names, you know, those three or four bands that tour together every summer that play, you know what I mean? It's you know, the same show it was last yeah, summer. Yeah, and, you know, come here, quote, the hits, end quote. Fuck that. We I mean, change the production <sighs> and the stage, and that's about yeah. it. Yeah. You know, come here, the hits, you know, when they advertise that and the fucking, you know, that's not what this is, and I don't want this to be that, you know? Metallica's changing the set list every single night, you know, using songs for their entire catalog. Who's in charge of that set list? I mean, is it predetermined before the show? And is there room to call audibles on stage, say if there's a beautiful topless woman holding up a sign that says, play the song Escape? What happens? Yours truly is the one that's mostly responsible for all that stuff. Um, I've been blessed with the trust of the other gentlemen in Metallica to um, kind of put the set list together every night. So I kind of do that. Um, I try and mix it from what we did the last couple of nights to what we did the last time we were in that particular city. Uh, when I walk into an arena, there's uh, a set list from um, the last time we played that particular venue, you know, five years ago, seven years ago. I always look at it, try and play different songs, try and play different songs than I did the night before, try and play, you know what I mean? I, I just always try and mix it up and try and, you know, if we're in a particular area, you know, then I try and mix it up so people will, um, you know, get different songs than, 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 you know, if they're traveling. There's a lot of Metallica fans that travel for hundreds of miles to see more than one show. And, and it's just, it, it's my duty to give them different songs and to make them feel special by, um, by, by changing it all, the, all every night. And not just for them, but for us, man, to keep it alive, to keep it real, to keep it, you know, vital, you know, to keep it, you know, just to keep it human, you know, because I don't want to get into this autopilot shit, you know, sit there and go out and like, we've done it, man. We played these long tours and we'd sit there and play the same songs every night for 150 shows or whatever. It's just like, you know, what happens if I change the song on the set list? You know, yeah, the lighting designer has a nervous breakdown because it takes him three days to change the computer memory or something do you know what i mean it's that kind of stuff that we used to get stuck in now we're not stuck in that anymore yeah now we just don't give a shit it's like oh yeah. the lights aren't following the song okay well at least you know most of us in the band are yeah wing it yeah james and i were trying to figure out like which songs have not been played live and one that we could come up with was escape is there a reason behind that or i'm sure james can answer that a little better than me <laughs> <laughs> i think that I don't know, look, you know, the way that everybody in this band is going right now, I think that we're up for playing anything. I mean, you know, we're, we're, um, you know, we could go anywhere. Um, my thoughts were that uh, James Hetfield was never, James Hetfield is, he has some peculiar relationships with some of the songs. And my thoughts were that um, maybe he was not, um, super fond of that particular song but uh you know who knows maybe i'll throw it on the set list one night and see what happens what has the first year with new bassist rob trujillo been like you know talking in terms of like how has he maybe changed metallica or or how he's, has he has he, how has he surprised you either just as a, a pal as a person or as a musician anything <laughs> He is so strong, man. He is so strong for this band, so right for this band, so great. So it's just such a vibe to be with him every day, to be with him, to share this whole thing. He's such a trooper. He's so open-minded. He's so into what's going on. He's so dedicated, and it's so awesome to share this experience with him. Um, it's effortless, man. It's effortless. We come up with jams in the studio. We come up with um, jams in the, in, in, in the tuning rooms. He just locks in. And he's just such a great friend and, and, and such a, and it's just so amazing uh, that he can, you know, he just fits so right in and it's just, it's so effortless. I don't know what, how else to put it. Okay. I know from uh, last year, and obviously we, do, we just talked earlier about how so st physically strenuous for you, and I know you jog a lot, so we're trying to get a little color out of each person as well. And when you're, which got, got me thinking, when, when you jog, I mean, are you, are you, do you listen to music? What are you thinking no. about? I mean, what, what's going through your mind? 
Maybe talk about that a bit. Is that the, the two minute signal? No, no, man, I think you got another 35 minutes. What? I I'll, can't, I gotta show it 8 20. I'll have you out of here in 15. I'm gonna have you out of here. We're, we're ahead of schedule, so. Okay. No, I'm fine, thanks. We were uh, ahead of schedule, you just ruined the moment. Thanks there, Mark. <laughs> Anyway, I um. Go ahead. Well, first of all, I don't, I don't, I don't jog. I run. Pardon me. <laughs> and um, and when I'm out doing that, it, it's it's mostly, it's peace and quiet. It's about escaping. It's about getting away from everybody. It, it's about the phone not ringing, the fax not, you know, showing fax is not showing up. That kind of stuff. I love running, and I love the mental energy that comes in the wake of running. That's that's what I get off on. And it's also a great way to kind of just get out in the fresh air, get out and just kind of breathe and scream and holler and, you know, stare and do all that stuff, you know. Let me talk about the, just the Governor's Award real quick. The band recently won the 2004 Governor's uh, Award for Creative Excellence by an outstanding achievement by the San Francisco chapter of the Recording Academy. Can you speak of the long historical connection between the band and the city by the bay? In 1982, Cliff Burton told me that he would not join Metallica unless we came up to the Bay Area. And then since then, it's been, it's been a love affair. It's been home. It's been, um, it's just been so easy. And, and, and we've been so proud to fly the flag for the Bay Area and to, um, to kind of, you know, represent and the musical legacy, the musical heritage that has been there. And it's just such an awesome place to be part of. I love the, the cultural curiosities, the cultural openness, the social, the political openness. People challenge each other. People do things to their own tune there. And, and it's just such a great place to live and to breathe and to exist. Here's a couple of song particulars we're going to use to play before songs throughout the month of Metallica. Until It Sleeps. I, I once read that you have a lukewarm feeling about that song. Is that true? Why? Um... I, it's just, it was a song that, that was more put together um, kind of in the computer than on the floor. It was kind of, we had a, a kind of a the skeleton of a song, some rough outlines. And then um, we kind of played it, it wasn't really working, then something else wasn't working, and then we tried this and then we tried that, and, and then it kind of ended up being, um, being um, kind of re-put together on the computer, and I just always felt that, I, th I always thought it felt a little sterile. Okay. Um, I've been talking to a lot of the guys on the road here, your, your crew guys, about which songs they, you know, and I'm going to ask you the same question, what, what songs they like hearing live the most, and Nothing Else Matters keeps coming up. And I found this in a, a section of Whiplash, or uh, from the So What magazine, a fan said, quote unquote, how would you have reacted if you had listened to Nothing Else Matters in 1983? You know that is completely impossible for me to answer that since it's not 1983. Exactly. Um, so that would be one of those that, that could make like an interesting like Spielberg movie or something, but I can't actually answer that question because I'm not good with the what if questions. Okay. Let's just go straight to what's your favorite Metallica song to play live or to just maybe, I know it's too hard to narrow it down to one, maybe a couple and why? Right now we're, every night I put the set list together from nor around 45 to 50 songs and um, there aren't there aren't any that I put in there that aren't, you know, at the very top. I mean, my favorites. Depends I mean, that has to change move. moment to moment. Yeah, but it at changes this moment, you know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I like playing Fuel. I like playing. Uh, I like playing Sanitarium. I like playing. We've been playing Holier Than Now a couple, two, three times on the tour. I like playing. Um, I don't know. Uh, no Leaf Clover is fun to play at the moment. That's what Kirk said. Uh, yeah, that's pretty fun. Yeah. All right, uh, this is the, the last question. Um, you can get a, a deep a, to it as you want to, but it, it's kind of off the subject of Metallica, but we're doing a big special coming up regarding 
Kurt Cobain's anniversary and whatnot. And I know there was, you know, there was a connection between you guys and them. Could you maybe retell us a story or maybe talk about how Nirvana has influenced you in, in any respect or just, just something? I mean, I, I, Kirk just told us about the story. We all, you guys almost went on tour together, which obviously didn't happen. And yeah, I mean, look, Kirk Cobain, you know, I mean, it's just one of those guys where you just sit there and go, whoa. And, and you know, I, I instantly go to the selfish element, which is like, uh, I never met him, and I really wanted to meet him, and I would have hoped that, you know, I had a moment to meet him because maybe it would have enriched my life even, you know, more than, than meeting other, other, other people or added something else to it, you know what I mean? just so amazing that you can have that kind of the you know you know musicians and people can connect with people at that level by just taking all the bullshit out of it you know what i mean and and this is so cool that 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 he could touch so many people and it's so sad that he's not around here 10 years later to kind of continue to touch people good thing is that the Nirvana music sounds as, I think, to me, as vital and as relevant and as, as, as kind of now as it, as it always has, you know. So I, I'm, I'm happy to just live on this planet with Kurt Cobain's music, and, and I feel that it, it's, it's pretty cool that he um, at least got a chance to throw what he threw out there. And then we should celebrate that instead of maybe focusing so much on what could have been or what, what isn't, you know? It's back. It's Metallica 2004. All month, it's mandatory Metallica. It's mandatory Metallica all week. All weekend. All month, you'll hear about the new tour, LiveMetallica.com, our new film, and much more. Mandatory Metallica, man, this is mandatory Metallica. I think I might have already said that. This is a mandatory Metallica moment. It's another mandatory Metallica moment, dot, dot, dot. Mandatory Metallica, dot, dot, dot. Hey, what's up, man? It's Lars from Metallica here. Keep it here for the next mandatory Metallica moment. Stay tuned for another mandatory Metallica moment. It's another mandatory Metallica moment. Mandatory Metallica. Hey, what's up, man? It's Lars from Metallica here. Keep it here for the next mandatory Metallica moment. Stay tuned for another mandatory Metallica moment. Guess what? <laughs> Uh, keep it here to score your tickets to see Metallica, some kind of monster, on the big screen. <laughs> yeah, for about three days, blink and you'll miss it, right? Metallica rocks the big screen, right? <laughs> some kind of monsters in theaters. Now, oops, you missed it. Get off your ass and go see it. Only one station can send you to see Metallica on the big screen. And now, a second show's been added. What are you going to use that in about three markets? Come on. Well, okay. Come on, let's get loaded, Detroit. <laughs> Keep it right here for your... Me <laughs> Keep it right here for your Metallica ticket hookup. Hey man, it's Lars from Metallica here. Get ready to rock with the Metallica. The 2004 Madly in Anger with the World Tour. Tickets on sale this Friday at 10 a.m. at noon. Tickets on sale this Saturday, 10 a.m. at noon, at one, at two, at three, at seven minutes past nine. Tickets on sale right now. Tickets are not on sale, fuck you. Tickets aren't gonna be on sale. You live in a city we don't care about. 
We're not going to play your fucking town. Tickets on sale now. Oops, you missed it. It's sold out already.